Joining me is Dr. Anna Davidson and her little furry friend, Petunia, and Petunia is a prairie dog. We do know that prairie dogs are not normally given to this kind of handling from people, so this is an unusual situation, right, Anna? Yes, very much so. This little guy is a rescue animal and used for education because he's uh, very friendly, but that's very rare. He's a local prairie dog. Why do you think it's important to restore prairie dogs to their native land? because they're considered to be keystone species. Keystone species are those species that are very important in an ecosystem. And so these guys are native to grassland ecosystems. They transform grassland landscapes. Um, they create a unique habitat for all kinds of other grassland animals. And they provide a really important food resource for all suites of um, predators. If suddenly there weren't prairie dogs in the bigger picture, there would be a problem. A keystone species is one that um, is also irreplaceable. So they have a large and really important effect on an ecosystem. So what happens is when they are lost from an ecosystem, that has a cascading effect. So when prairie dogs decline in an area, the predators that associate with them also decline. The animals that are dependent on the habitats they create also decline. One of the most notable is a black-footed ferret. There were 13 left in the wild in the 1980s. Because of the decline of prairie dogs, black-footed ferrets rely on prairie dogs for over 90% of their diet. And so they have become one of North America's most endangered mammals. So this is a really interesting Part of the story is that the Fish and Wildlife Service has put in a large amount of effort and funding, millions of dollars, into this recovery program for the black-footed ferret. But yet, they are running out of significant enough habitat for them to reestablish their populations in because there's not the significant large populations of prairie dog colonies so this left. this might not work. We need unfenced. large, <laughs> unfenced areas that can support predator populations like the black-footed ferret. And when the government is putting in all of these resources to restore the ferret populations, but yet they are also putting in funds to reduce prairie dog populations. These two efforts are in complete yeah. conflict. Because they provide unique habitat for all kinds of species and important prey for many species, they increase overall biodiversity. And they also, because they're providing a unique environment, so they're colonies, they act like islands, unique islands of grassland habitat dotted across the landscape. I would never have thought if somebody mentioned that there were keystone species that prairie dogs were among those. So that's interesting to me, but also what are some other keystone species? Some examples of keystone species would include predators like wolves. So predators help to, through their trophic interactions, they help to maintain the balance of the ecosystem by affecting the prey abundance and then the prey's effect on the rest of the ecosystem. So they have this top-down effect and are really important in ecosystems that way. Burrowing mammals like prairie dogs are another kind of keystone species and that's because they play this role through their trophic effects. For example, grazing um, grassland vegetation. They modify the nutrient quality uh, of the grassland, which attracts um, bison to their colonies and even cattle to their colonies wow. um, by increasing the nutrition in the vegetation. Are they at risk? Yes, their populations have declined about 98% across their former range. So prairie dogs occur across the central grasslands of North America from Canada to Mexico. Mm. And there's five different species of prairie dogs, all of which are uh, threatened, endangered, or declining and have declined significantly. 98%, wow. Well, a lot of people think that prairie dogs are still really abundant because, where they, because they see them all the time. And that's often because we're seeing them along highway medians, within cities where they remain. Right. But out in the broad grassland landscapes, 
they are largely absent. And that is because of widespread extermination programs that have gone on since the early 1900s. Those efforts still continue today, but not to the same degree as that they used to be in the early 1900s. That was designed to be mass eradication. Now it's more about controlling their populations. But you're also, saying that's not necessarily a good thing. No, absolutely not. Because they play this important role in these ecosystems, their presence is really essential, particularly at the landscape scale. Because of what I was describing, mm -hmm. how prairie dogs provide these important habitats across that landscape mm -hmm. and provide really important prey for many predators, they need to occur in a large in large numbers Got it. across okay. that landscape in order to play their keystone role. And you have a diagram that sort of yes. explains that. And what are we exactly. seeing in the diagram exactly? The bottom of the diagram shows the colonies and how they would look like these little islands of habitat across the greater landscape. And then the, the middle one shows what a colony is like. And then the top one shows what a mound is like, a soil mound. And what's really neat to think about is that these little mounds, they provide their own unique habitat as well. So all kinds of invertebrates, so um, different kinds of bugs will associate with those mounds. So essentially, these mounds act like colonies. Prairie dogs and bison got along for thousands of years. Yeah. And then along come cattle and sheep, mixing up that kind of delicate balance we're talking about. Tell me about that. Well, this is a really important point that cattle and prairie dogs are perceived to be um, competitors in grassland ecosystems. But yet, as you say, bison and prairie dogs coexisted for thousands of years. And the ecological role of these large herbivores like bison and cattle with prairie dogs is such that they, they actually can have a mutualistic relationship. What it is, is that prairie dogs benefit from these large grazers opening up the grassland habitat. Mm. By doing so, the prairie dogs can see predators better. And so their colonies will thrive in areas that have been opened up by these large herbivores. Suddenly I'm getting this view that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on out there that we just don't know about. And the more we discover about their re ecological relationships with other animals and, and the entire ecosystem, the more we see how important they are. It's just wild to think about a tiny little prairie dog yes. and a bison. Well, they co-evolved with yeah. one another. And so when bison have been removed from much of North America, by, they've been replaced by cattle. And so now cattle are having this similar kind of ecological interaction, except that cattle are confined to fences. They're not these large Big roaming rangers. herds yeah. of wild animals. And so therefore there's potential conflict. They can overgraze an area when the animals mm. co-occur together because the prairie dogs, they're sedentary animals. They occur in these colonies. And you can imagine that these cattle are coming into those colonies and they, can, and they prefer to graze on them. And then that combination of these two major herbivores can have a larger impact on the grassland, particularly when the cattle can't move across right. the greater landscape. What a big difference we can make by putting up a fence. Really. It really does come down to overstocking the grassland with too many domestic livestock um, in combination with confining them into within a, a fence landscape. So what exactly are you doing to preserve the, the prairie dog population, or I should say restore it? One of the things we're doing at the Seviata National Wildlife Refuge, for example, it's located in central New Mexico. And what is really interesting is I went out with the person that was leading the extermination efforts of prairie dogs. What he told me was that they would go out on horsebacks with these burlap sacks full of laced grain and they would sprinkle it across the landscape. Hmm. And the thing about this is that so many animals from insects to coyotes like this mm, grain. Like grain. So you can imagine the widespread indiscriminate <laughs> poisoning mm. that occurred throughout this region and throughout the central grasslands in general. And frankly, they still do this. 
So no matter how you look at it, it's not just poisoning prairie dogs right. or losing the prairie dogs. It's losing that the ecosystem and the species associated with them. Well, and how challenging must it be to restore an ecosystem? That's the beauty of a keystone species. It's easier to restore a system if you can restore that key component to the ecosystem. And prairie dogs are a key component. Exactly. So that's what our big effort is, to restore the prairie dog and to monitor the uh, response of the community to the restoration of this animal as it recolonizes the landscape. But it has been challenging because what we think is going on is with climate change, the region is becoming hotter and drier. Droughts are becoming more yeah. frequent and intense. And consequently, it's challenging for the reintroductions to be successful. We have to put a sure. lot of effort to keep these animals, um, their populations going and get them well established. We're, we're monitoring the population dynamics over time to see how successful these reintroductions can be. What are the challenges? What can we yeah. learn from this process to make it successful within this kind of region? What inspired you to go into this line of work? I've always been interested in wildlife um, and conservation. And when I was 18 years old, I was working with the wildlife rescue um, here in New Mexico. And my friends always knew that I was very <laughs> um, into animals and conservation. And I got this phone call from one of my girlfriends. She said, oh my god, Anna, you have to come over <laughs> here. We've got prairie dogs being bulldozed outside my apartment complex. Oh my and you know, so I go over to this area, and I literally see this property with these big bulldozers um, scraping the land surface. and literally prairie dogs running from the bulldozers. It was a very powerful experience. And I thought, well, what can I do? Oh my God. And so I'm trying to call whatever resources I could think of to get people involved. And there was a woman that was um, involved and started Prairie Dog Pals of Albuquerque uh, at the time. And, and she came over to help rescue the prairie dogs. And that's what got me involved in starting to um, do the relocations and restorations. But the other thing is I was, in, um, I was an undergraduate in the biology program and still trying to figure out you know, what I wanted to do. And I started exploring the ecological role of prairie dogs, trying to read about them. And I'm learning that they are so important in these ecosystems. But Who also, knew? <laughs> exactly, that's what people are really starting to discover is how important they are to grassland ecosystems. But then I also learned how hated they are as well. Mm. So what I, what I realized, exactly, they're vermin, they're rodents, rodents yeah. you know, or that's what they're thought of. So they're, what I realized is they're among the most important, but yet among the most hated animals. And so we, I figured they had one of the biggest challenges to overcome in conservation. They parallel the story of wolves. Same thing, they're among the most important in these ecosystems, but also among the most hated. And so there's a huge conservation challenge. Sure. Um, and so that's what got me into um, studying prairie dogs. That's great, and a great reason too. Friend of prairie dogs, Dr. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome.